My name is Josh Kelso. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Bible Church, and this is the time in our service where each week we celebrate and partake the Lord's Supper together. We do communion with one another, and this is something that is precious for us to do together because, in a sense, it forces us to pause in our religious practices and to take personal inventory of our lives before God, to remember what we believe in our faith is rooted in a person, the person, Jesus Christ, the God-man. And the most crucial question one could ever contemplate and consider is the question, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? And if you think you do, is it the right Jesus? Because many profess a belief in Jesus and many claim to believe in Jesus, but they have created in their minds a different Jesus. And believing in the wrong Jesus saves no one. So do you know Jesus? You you cannot be wrong in your answer to this question and be right with God. You could be faithful in every religious practice. You could be the most moral person that you know. And if you do not know Jesus, you are no closer to God. To be saved, one must know Jesus. And in our salvation, we must ever keep Jesus before us. And that's what we're going to do this morning as we remember Christ. So I'd like you to consider with me Colossians 1, verses 15 through 23, and we're going to see six descriptions of who Jesus is as we unpack what Scripture has to say about the God-man, Jesus Christ. Starting in verse 15, first we see that Jesus is the image of God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We can see all of Christ. We can see all of God in Christ. We can see all of God's attributes in Jesus. Jesus is both the representation and the manifestation of God. He is the full and final, complete revelation of God. And he is the firstborn among creation. What that means is he is the inheritor of all things. He is supreme. Everything is for him. Next, we see he's the creator of all things. In verse 16, for by him, all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus created all things. And if all you considered was the universe, this should be overwhelmingly astonishing and impressive. But here we also see that he created all that is in heaven as well. And Jesus not only created all things, but every created thing, every ruler, every authority is all in place for him and for his glory. And in this, we see that he is the ruler of all things. Look at verse 17. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Think about every single detail that must continue to sustain our very existence. Every single thing is held together by Jesus. Four, he's the head of the church. Look at verse 18. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Who is Jesus? He's the head of the body, the church. Christ gives life and direction to the church, and he is the firstborn from the dead. Some were raised from the dead, right? Consider Lazarus. But Jesus has been raised from the dead to never die again, and he was the first to do this. And in this, he has come to have first place in everything. He reigns supreme above all else. Everything is taking place for the purpose of God to glorify and magnify His son, Jesus, will be honored in all things. Next, in verse 19, we see that Jesus is the fullness of God. For it was the Father's good pleasure, in verse 19, for all the fullness to dwell in him. Fullness was a term the Gnostics used to refer to divine powers and attributes. They believed these divine powers were spread out among various spirits and beings. And Paul addresses that here by stating that the fullness of God is found in one person. And that one person with whom the fullness of God is found is in Jesus. 
What a precious truth and reality. You don't need a bunch of various spirits to be saved and to have fellowship with God, but rather one being holds the power of salvation, and his name is Jesus. And then in verse 20, we see that he is the reconciler of all things. The reconciler of all things. Look at verse 20. And through him, that is Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Through the blood of his cross, Jesus reconciled all things to their proper place under his authority. And here when Paul refers to Christ's blood, he is pointing to the fact that Jesus' death was the only acceptable sacrifice The the only acceptable substitute to take the place of all who would believe in him. And at the cross, Jesus suffered so that we could find peace. And he felt pain that we might have healing. He experienced death that in him we might have life. He experienced separation from God that we might be reconciled to God. And he did this to reconcile all things to himself. And this is truly astonishing. You see, Jesus' death was far-reaching. Not all the objects of the God-man's reconciling act are affected the same way, right? Jesus' death did not bring about a salvation of every single person in all existence. It is for those who believe, and yet the reconciling act at the cross, which Jesus completed, reconciled all things, whether believing or unbelieving, under his proper place as supreme ruler over them. Not all of the objects of the God-man's reconciling act are affected the same way. Some are reconciled under his rule into fellowship with him, but also those who remain opposed to him are reconciled under his judgment and wrath. There is a rightful subjection under the authority of Jesus that comes through Jesus' death and resurrection. And all things are in subjection under his feet, as Ephesians 1 21 and 22 says. And in this, we find a staggering truth that Jesus' death, his blood, has a far-reaching effect and that the cross is not only about the salvation of sinners, but it is about the exaltation of Christ to his rightful place. And this has happened at the cost of his own blood. The men are going to come and pass out the bread and the cup. And these are symbols for us to take and to remember Christ. The bread represents his body, which was crushed on behalf of all who would believe in him. And the cup, the juice, represents his blood that was shed and poured out so that we might be reconciled to God in fellowship as his children now. And so the men are going to come and pass out those two elements, and I encourage you to hold them and contemplate the wonders of what Christ has done in the gospel and where there is known sin, confess that sin, and where there is victory in Christ in holiness, praise him and thank him and remember that that has only come because of his great sacrifice. And if you do not believe in Christ, there will be a day when you bow before him. And it could either be today for your joy and your fellowship with him and your reconciliation to him. Or it will be on the other side of the grave in submission and judgment. And I would plead with you to repent and to turn to Christ today and experience the joy and the hope and the forgiveness of sins that can only be found in Christ. But if you choose not to, then we would simply ask that you let the bread and the cup Go by as this time is for believers, Christians, to remember our great Savior, to remember our Jesus as God has put forth in his word that we might worship him, express our love for him, and gratefulness remember what he has done.